It's great to welcome to the program today, Scott Galloway, who is professor of marketing at NYU's Stern School of Business and also author of Adrift America in 100 Charts. Uh, Scott, great to have you on. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, David. You know, there's always a risk to introducing anyone because my audience will say, well, David, you're, you're really very wrong about how you framed this guest. But one of the things that, at the t well, I'm going to acknowledge that risk and say one of the things I find interesting about uh, some of your work is you talk about uh, men and gender and masculinity in a way that to me seems quite both empathetic, but also realistic when it comes to um, uh, men and boys without falling into what some might describe as a sort of like a men's rights activist type umbrella and dismiss what you say. I've actually been really interested about a lot of the things that you've talked about, about modern masculinity. Do you find that there is a desire from those who listen to your commentary on gender and men? There's a desire to put you either on this side or that side, or that there really is a sort of welcoming of the, the, the way you want to discuss it, which I think is much more nuanced than many others. Uh, thanks for the question. It's a thoughtful question. I, it's changed a lot. If you talked about, if you advocated for young men two years ago and said that, you know, when it was 60, 40, uh, male, female in college, and now it's reversed, but we're not talking about it. People saw it as a zero sum game and they immediately conflated advocating for young men or highlighting some of the struggles young men uh, face as being misogynist. You couldn't be pro male without being anti female. And uh, over the last 24 months, it's changed. And unfortunately, I think some of that is because a lot of the a lot of the kind of pro, there was a lot of thinly veiled misogyny masking is pro male. I, I don't, I think some of the celebrities that are, or people on TikTok that have gotten some attention, it's just blatantly a fairly conservative. Um, there's some, there's some troubling aspects to, to some of the people who've been labeled as pro male, and that is they're blaming women or that the, some of their content does come off as misogynist. So I don't think that's helped have a serious conversation, but you have people like Richard Reeves and talking his great book of boys to men. I've read about half of it so far. Yeah. Have said, look, this is clearly an issue. And the, the group I hear from, I hear from two cohorts. I hear from young men and oftentimes they're upset because they think I'm accusing them of being incels. And so I get both positive and negative feedback from young men. I get some negative feedback from young women who feel is if, look, where, where were you? Men have had a 400 year head start. Where were you when women were struggling? And I would argue, well, I think we were there for women and we still have work to do, but I think society has been there. Um, the people I get the most support from, hands down, are mothers. And the conversation goes something like this. I have two daughters, one's at Penn, one's in PR in Chicago, both killing it. And I have a son who's in the basement vaping and playing video games. Mm. And the data is just overwhelming. And we're finally having an honest conversation about the fact that three times as likely to be addicted, four times as likely to kill themselves, 12 times as likely to be incarcerated. Uh, two for every one male college graduate in the next year, uh, five years, we're going to have two female college graduates. So there are real issues here. And also there's an emerging class of recognition that the people who would like more economically and emotionally viable young men is women. So I, I think we're finally having what I'd call a civil conversation around it. One of the things that I find really interesting, and I hope I'm summarizing some of the things you've written and said accurately, and if not, I'm sure you'll tell me, is that you point out, or I at least interpret some of the things you say as pointing out, that some of the grievances that maybe the more right-leaning folks on this issue have about the state of young men are a direct result of some of the cultural shifts and norms and stories that are told by those very people in terms of I'll give a few examples. Um, what is uh, what is masculine when it comes to parenting, as an example, and these images of and stereotypes of, hey, you know, the, the, the dad pushing around the stroller rather than working, that's not masculine in the way that it should be for as, as an example, or that's my example, not yours necessarily. Mm -hmm or stories about, you know, empathy and being in touch with one's emotions 
should be uh, should not be welcomed, for example, among so-called masculine men. It seems to me, and I'm curious whether you agree, that some of those stories maybe perpetuate the very problems that you're pointing out. Yeah, it's an interesting conversation because I think masculinity is a wonderful thing and it's been incorrectly conflated with toxicity, which is just bullshit. The toxic masculinity is a term that has really been destructive because there are just certain situations where people want to demonstrate masculinity. And the, the key is to define what it means. I think it means being more risk aggressive. It means taking chances. Uh, if I tried to distill a modern or a mature form of masculinity down to a statement, it would be acquiring skills and strengths such that you can protect and advocate for others. And by the way, masculinity is not the sole domain of people born as men. I think a lot of women demonstrate masculinity. I think a lot of men dem demonstrate wonderful feminine attributes. Uh, I'm kind of, most of my friends I would describe as, as having more feminine attributes than the majority of men. But let's celebrate femininity and the wonderful things it brings to the fore and also masculinity. So it, I believe, for example, and I've gotten shit for saying this, I think every man should take economic responsibility for their household. And by the way, sometimes that means recognizing as much as it may hurt that your partner is better at that whole money thing than you and taking more responsibility for supporting her career, his career and getting out of the way. I think that's a masculine attribute. Somebody, and ideally both of you, need to take economic responsibility for the household. I think being really, really strong and having incredible uh, grit and resilience, lifting heavy weights, running long distances in your mind and in the gym is a wonderful thing. Men are stronger than women. Lean into that. They're stronger physically. Uh, women are stronger in terms of their ability to endure, you know, they have much higher threshold for pain, otherwise they would never uh, survive childbirth. Yeah. But I say to young men, if you are not strong, you should be able to walk in any room and have the confidence that if shit got real, you could kill and eat everybody or outrun them. And I'm not suggesting you do either of those things, but I'm suggesting it's a wonderful thing to live, lean into and there's nothing wrong with it. And then what do you do with that strength? You're more confident. You're more kind in certain situations. You de-escalate the situation. The strongest, most impressive men I've ever met in a bar fight are the ones that step in and de-escalate the situation. That's what it means to be a man. That's what it means to, do, to express masculinity. So I like the idea of trying to define, you know, if you're Tarzan, what vines you're going to swing on. Masculinity for me when I was, you know, you look like a very young man, David, but when I was young, I thought masculinity meant being awesome, sleeping with as many strange women as possible and being ripped. I didn't go into the gym to get fit. I went in to be big. And now as I've gotten older, I find that you know, being civic, voting, being friendly to your neighbors, taking an interest in a child that isn't yours. I think that being really strong, you know, now for my age, and I hate to say that, I have to qualify everything for my age. Those things make me feel strong like bull. And I'm leaning into those things. I love those things. I love making and spending a lot of money. I love protecting people. And I'm doing a lot of virtue signaling right now. But those are masculine attributes. I'm, I'm a risk aggressive person. I've started businesses. Uh, and there's nothing, and I'm physical on a lot of dimensions, and those are wonderful attributes. And by the way, women can demonstrate those attributes, but masculinity should be absolutely celebrated. When Ukrainians or when Russians pour over the border, as Bill Maher said, you know, the Ukrainian army, you want some of that big energy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, I think we need to celebrate it. It comes with downsides, it comes with upsides, as does every other attribute of the species. But um, I, I'd say lean into it and just define what it means. And we need a more mature um, version of masculinity. Last thing I want to mention on this, and then I want to talk about the book a little bit. I'm curious. I, I've not heard you comment on this, and I don't know if you have. One of the things I've observed over the last mm, six to 18 months in the political space has been that one of the topics that gets the biggest rise out of right wing crowds, and by this I'm talking about your typical Trump rally, as well mm -hmm. as CPAC in Texas over the summer, what got the crowd mm -hmm. the most excited was stuff about gender and trans people. The, one of the mm -hmm. biggest applause lines at CPAC over the summer was when Ted Cruz said, my pronouns are kiss my ass, and the crowd went absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest applause lines during the Trump rally is when Trump talks about um, uh, a, a trans woman in a weightlifting competition easily lifting hundreds of pounds more than everybody else. And just how, you know, we got we got to get men out of women's sports, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you make anything or what do you make of the fact that those stories 
have become so titillating to a large portion of the country? Well, when when everything is a you know when everything is a nail, you know all you have or is what looks like a cultural war, and that is we don't want to talk about income inequality, we don't want to talk about inflation or growing the economy, so let's get people emotionally triggered by a small number of uh, instances. The, the, the governor of South Dakota spends precious resources and time trying to pass a law that protects women's sports from transgender athletes. And by the way, conceptually, it's a conversation worth having. I don't think a six foot five person born as a male who's had testosterone pour over their muscle and bone structure should be competing in what had traditionally been a woman's swim meet. I think that's an honest conversation we should have. But when you have the governor of a state passing laws to quote unquote protect girls sports, and then we find there isn't a single instance in the entire state of a of a person who has tried to be compete as a woman who was born a male, you have to say, well, are, 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 they, are they interested in honest conversation or are they just interested in triggering people and, and leading a, a, us down a path of demonstrating hate towards a community that has been subject to just so much bullshit? It's just, I mean, at the end of the day, the far right claims to embrace Jesus. We're, we're supposed to be loving people. We're supposed to be accepting of them. We're supposed to be. And they also, one of the things I love about GOP principles is in really tough issues, you defer to the individual. Why wouldn't we let families and doctors figure out what is or isn't the right thing about this? If it, we end up in a statewide swim meet, okay, let's have the conversation. But we're talking about it's again, it's this, it's a similar conversation where they say, well, Democrats want you to be able to abort your baby, you know, the week before you, your water breaks. That doesn't happen. It's a theoretical situation meant to trigger people emotionally and divide us. It's not productive. It's rooted in hate. It's rooted in cheap politics. And it, 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 it doesn't advance us forward. It, one of the things from my book is a segue to the book looking at all the issues that plague us, David, whether it's income inequality, whether it's the very serious issues around climate change, whether it's, you know, our polarization. If America's problems were a horror movie, it would be the call is coming from inside of the house. Instead of taking time to focus on how we um, uh, establish more chips to ensure that we're not relying on the Chinese during a conflict, instead of focusing on how we ensure that we bring up our bottom fifth of education level, that we get one out of five households out of poverty that have children, we start talking about this bullshit and we start talking, and when I say bullshit, I mean anything that divides us. 34% of Democrats, I'm sorry, 54% of Democrats are worried the kid's gonna marry a Republican. A third of people in each party think people in the other party are their mortal enemy. Americans will never have greater allies than other Americans. And I find the far right especially, but also the far left, are more interested in embarrassing the other side than they are about advancing the nation. And we have to get back to a point where we recognize first and foremost, we're Americans. We're not Republicans and Democrats. I'm a huge World War II history buff. I have this great photo of these men uh, wading into the water as the front gate slammed down on their landing craft heading towards Omaha Beach and the invasion of Normandy. Two out of three of these men, average age 26, wouldn't leave the beach alive. And I imagine that they can su suspend the time space continuum, see our problems, and go, you can't fix that shit. I can't imagine any of those men looked at each other and even knew who was a Republican or a mm -hmm. Democrat. So we are energy independent, we are food independent, we have eradicated diseases, we are more, we are more prosperous than any nation in the world, but we've decided we don't like each other. And when you take very tiny examples of trans athletes that are meant to evoke an emotional re response, all you are doing is saying, I want Americans to hate each other. I don't want America to move forward. I want Americans to hate each other. We should have an honest conversation. Parents who want to have an honest conversation around gender affirmation and be informed when a kid under the age of 18 um, asks for hormone therapy at a school, that's an honest conversation. We should have that conversation. But according to Republican principles, we should have it at the school and the family level. And there are, to be blunt, this is really an edge of edge case. 
and they want to turn it into a cultural issue because they don't want to really talk about what ails us. So it's like, come on, let's get back to where we were as Americans, have more respect for the individual and stop using edge cases to trigger people such that we're angry at each other. It's totally unproductive. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the the book. Um, again, the book is Adrift, America and 100 Charts. One of the things that will often happen when you talk to folks who are maybe to some degree siloed in a particular area is there's this sometimes instinct to say, here's really the chart or the statistic or the issue that explains all or the vast majority of what's going on. There's this desire to be like, this is the thing really that that this is all about. And sometimes it's income inequality or it's mm -hmm. the climate or it's the gender pay gap or whatever the case may be. One of the interesting things about your book is that you actually look at a ton of different dimensions. But I guess the, the question I have is, is there some overarching thing that you believe links these together in terms of explaining this adrift status quo that you point out some some general takeaway, which then we can use to look at some of the specifics. So if you had to zero in on one chart, that would be ground zero um, for the for the detonation and all our other problems are kind of the blast zone as you go to different outer rings. Yes, it's in the early 70s up until the early 70s. Productivity and wage growth were like two snakes intertwined. The right. nation got more productive through manufacturing or processes or service technologies, and wages went up. We got much more productive. Wages went up a lot. We shared in our prosperity. In the early 70s, wages went flat for 50 years, despite the fact that productivity kept going up and to the right. And the delta between these two lines is literally tens of trillions of dollars in surplus value that wage earners, current income, didn't get to participate in. And I think that when when you have now for the first time in the nation's history, a 30 year old man or woman isn't doing as well as his or her parents were at the age of 30. When you have for the first time, more than half of people under the age of 30 are not living with a romantic partner or a friend, they're living with their parents. You have rage, you have shame, you have roommates reminding you of your failure every day named mom and dad. And when people aren't doing well, when the ultimate compact in our society, and that is your kids will do better than you has been broken, People look for scapegoats, they get angry, they start believing in uh, a cons conspiracy theory, they start looking for heroes and cult figures that will rally them and blame somebody else and tell them that they're victims. So the lack of shared progress, we've been enormously prosperous over the last 50 years. We will produce this month, we will, we will produce more output this month than we produced an entire year in the 1950s. It's our, you could see in five to 10 years, we might be able to produce as much in a quarter as we produced in a decade in the middle of the last century. The problem is a lot of that prosperity is not translating to progress. Because if you don't feed the engine that fights your wars, pays the majority of your taxes, and is responsible for civility and progress in our nation, see above the middle class, a society declines. China has brought 500 million people into the middle class in the last 50 years. We've shed 10 million. So, in sum, ground zero, the epicenter, is when wages decoupled from productivity. And does that, I mean, I can, I can speculate about how that would connect to education, that would connect to dealing with climate issues, that would connect to social services, access to healthcare. I mean, it seems as though when you think about that particular chart where you start to see a separation between productivity and wage growth, you really can connect that to so many of the different charts and things you talk about. Yeah, it really, it just ripples out. And what you have is um, there's this, there's a few myths that we need to bust. The first is that the middle class is a naturally occurring economic force. It's not, if you let the economy just run totally, you know, Ayn Rand, just totally free market, the middle class starts to erode because wealthy people get access to powerful politicians especially with Citizens United, who tend to take the tax code from 400 pages to 4,000, who can navigate a complex tax code, the wealthy. If you can navigate by starlight, you wanna, you wanna run boat races at night. We're run, our tax code is complex. People of my income level can afford people to help them navigate, and we end up with a regressive tax structure. Education, me and my colleagues every morning wake up in the morning and say, 
ask ourselves one question. How do we reduce our accountability while, while increasing our compensation? We have found the ultimate strategy, and that is to tap into the 10% wealthiest American households with a luxury positioning, and that is artificially constrained supply such that 30, 20, 10% admission rates, and we stand up and applaud the dean and the alumni love it, and we've morphed towards this bullshit rejectionist luxury positioning in our society where once I have a degree from a good university, I want them to pull up the drawbridge because then my degree becomes more valuable. Once I have a house, I show up to the local review board and try and squash any new development to make my the price of my house go up. And once I have a successful tech company, I weaponize government to not let any emerging companies come out of the crib through monopoly abuse. If we don't consistently create opportunities for other people to enjoy the prosperity that my generation has enjoyed, if you don't have tr if you don't have churn, if you don't stop these ridiculous bailouts of small businesses and create a cartoon, the wealthiest people in America are small business people. When you just f bail out rich people and companies, you're robbing from young people because the reason I'm wealthy is because as I was coming into my prime income years in 2008, Amazon and Apple went down 90% and I got to buy them and then register a 20 and 40 fold respectively increase. And two years ago, we decided to bail out the markets. And as a result, as a result, young people didn't get their shot to buy Brooklyn real estate or Amazon stock, you know, at 40, 60, 70% off. So America used to be the best place to get rich. It slowly but surely become the best place to stay rich. Everything we do right now, fiscally, and legislatively is an attempt to take money from a younger generation who have seen their wealth from go from 19% of GDP to 9%. We have cut the wealth of people your age in half. The average person, 70 year old, is 72% wealthier than they were 40 years ago. The person, average person under the age of 40 is 22% less wealthy. My generation has basically said to a younger generation, F you, I got mine, get yours. I'm going to borrow your credit card and your kid's credit card such that Nana and pop -Off can upgrade from Carnival to Crystal Cruises. Unless we reinvest in the middle class, it will correct. And the, me the means of correction will either be war, famine, or revolution. Uh, I, I hate to end on such a negative note. That was note, a word but salad, wasn't it? Not every, <laughs> not every interview has a happy ending, which is okay, which is okay. Uh, we've been speaking with Scott Galloway, professor of marketing at NYU, also author of Adrift America in 100 Charts. Scott, I really appreciate your time and talking to me today. David, thanks for your good work and thanks for having me.